So our next presentation will be given by um, Gary Crawford of the University of Toronto. And his presentation title is An Archaeological Perspective on Sustainable Agroecology and Millet Production in Hokkaido. Well, thanks, Junko. And um, I think this is a good follow up because uh, I'm going to go a long way before World War II to contextualize this whole business of agroecology and millet production. And um, this is going to be a wide ranging talk. So um, uh, I'm going to uh, start with some fundamentals here. And uh, we've already heard about these millets, but just a few things about their conditions. For example, these three millets all um, re require relatively short growing seasons, anywhere up to 114 days and certainly shorter than that, down to 60. And each of these has somewhat different um, characteristics. Uh, um, Kibi or the common millet um, grows really quite far north. Um, um, all of these have high protein and fat content. They're all pretty nutritious. A Japanese millet is on one extreme because it, um, it actually prefers slightly wetter habitats. So it can do well in, in um, sort of um, damper environments as well as, uh, as, well as uh, dry conditions. So in the center is the Japanese millet. And this was um, a massive field of Japanese millet uh, that I found in Hokkaido um, back in the 1970s. And um, one of the other characteristics about these millets, and it's particularly characteristic of uh, hia or Japanese millet, is that they tend to easily reestablish themselves in old fields. And to some extent, they can do without uh, human planting. Uh, they can survive. They kind of contrast with the normal definition of a domesticated plant that requires human inter intervention all the time or they die out. These tend to be a bit more flexible. In fact, they went to Harvard, uh, the Harvard Herbarium some years ago to examine uh, some of the millets in their collections. And many of the ones that they had collected were found on the, along the roadsides in New England, so they'd escaped. Uh, as well. So the other main thing to point out is that um, they're all uh, evolutionarily related I and mean, probably millions of years ago they had the same ancestor but they've uh, diversified over time and then humans got their hands on them and diversified them even further. But uh, the oldest millet that we're getting comes from North China and in one of my studies at the Yue Zhuang site dating to around 8,000 years ago we found really some of the beginnings of this um, millet agriculture. Now, the point here isn't to go over early agriculture in China. The point here is to, um, is to look at some of the details which you can read along the left. But, in but looking over a 5,000 year period, so there are three sites here that represent 5,000 year periods. And what we can see is that in the earliest period, around 9,000 years ago, we're beginning to see some crops show up, but not a lot. But by uh, 8,000 years ago, um, these um, millets are, are pretty regularly found with, with a little bit of, of, um, of soybean coming along. And by 4,000 years ago, they're still using a lot of millet, but rice is added to this complex as well. But, rice, but millet is, pretty, is still pretty important. The difference in length in the bar is just the subtleties of the archeological record and, and sort of different circumstances. The other point I wanted to make is that these crops are associated with a group of, um, of weeds, generally annual weeds, and they tend to be grasses and they also tend to be very closely related to the, the millets that they're growing with. So one, one um, ethnobotanist working in Africa described these as swarms of, um, of wild millets are grasses that are very closely related to millets that can cross with them, increase diversity, and so forth. Now, they may be evidence of, um, of fallow periods, but they also are likely evidence of, of the rather disinterest by these people to, to weed and so forth. So these things all grow together quite well. And it also means the millets and these weeds are growing in the same conditions, primarily. So that's the main thing there. And in terms of another of another level of um, of landscape management or management going to a general level, we can go further south. Now I'm getting out of the I'm getting out of the millet growing area, but um, 
But there's a lesson here that I want to point out. So this is a huge site dating to about 6,000 years ago uh, near Hangzhou Bay and called Tian Woshan. And it's a waterlogged site well preserved. But I want to draw your attention to this um, pit over here, which has been preserved in this plexiglass. And it contains about 20,000 acorns. And there are about a dozen of these pits. So there are about a quarter of a million acorns recovered uh, from Tian Woshan. And I think the issue here is that um, what we're seeing is, is that this production is beyond, I think, that uh, what a natural sort of woodland, which, can, which has oaks as a component, can produce. And uh, pardon my pun here, but the smoking gun um, speaks to the potential for, for um, uh, burning of the landscape to manage these oaks, much like uh, in, in ethnohistoric California. And we have archaeological data that seems to suggest that this is happening in eastern North America too. So the, something to keep in mind is that these oak trees produce large masses of acorns when they get lots of sunlight, they're stimulated to produce um, these acorns. So just keep that in mind. Let's take a look at Hokkaido. And in the broader scheme of things, Jomon sites are fairly well established in the landscape. And in some cases, we find, um, we find good evidence of landscape modification. So for example, the uh, Kakinoshima A site in southwestern Hokkaido in Hakodate, in, in what was formerly uh, known as Minami Kayabecho, where I did a lot of my work, we see extensive landscape modification over about six millennia. And this is a, a, a horseshoe-shaped earthwork with, with a community in between. And it was likely uh, a shared space by many Jomon communities throughout this, this area. And you can see the extent to which there has been labor put into this. Um, this, is a, this is a section through part of this, um, part of this uh, uh, mound showing all of the, um, the anthropogenic sediment and garbage that's been used to produce this. And I would point out that this kind of a landscape has to have a particular form of ecology. My expertise is to dis, is sort of disentangle the meaning of the plant remains from these archaeological sites. So we collect as much plant remain, many plant remains from sites using particular sampling procedures as we can. I just want to give you some of the highlights of what we find in the Jomon sites. So we do find arboreal species being used, but for the most part, um, nuts um, such as uh, kurumi are, are, are hit and miss. It depends on the site, but what we do find regularly are these forest edge species such as, um, such as actinidia and rubus, even um, sumac and lacquer tree. And then we also see these annual plants and, and these annual plants are so common in the archaeological record. Um, and, and they're all edible and economically useful plants. We see them throughout the Neolithic around the world being used. And there are patterns, and I don't want to go over this in detail, other than to point out that there is a kind of a Jomon pattern where you see in the initial Jomon starting very early, 9,000 years ago, we begin to see these annual weeds and a few of these perennial ones popping up. But by the time we get to early Jomon, they expand considerably and we get into Hachinohe and Tohoku where a graduate student of mine work, we get uh, a very similar pattern. The Epi Jomon represents the end of the Jomon in Hokkaido. We see something very, very different. We see something that seems to symbolize less intensive use of space over the long term. This seems to be more temporary kinds of spaces related to this. Lacquer appears to be a plant that would have been managed um, and we're able to identify this archaeologically and lacquerware was uh, in fact of significance to these Jomon peoples in terms of painting pottery and it's also been used on clothing and this is from a burial at uh, Kakinoshima A where lacquer is preserved from the, um, the burial clothing that this individual was wearing. And we also get extensive weedy grass presence like we do in the Neolithic in China. Um, we get uh, a local wild uh, kind of barley species showing up. Digitaria, a, a type of crabgrass, uh, is, is, is really quite common on um, early and middle Jomon sites. Uh, 
And it's extremely common in Chinese Neolithic sites where it's so common, I suspect they were growing it as a crop. But it also grows as an invasive in, um, in uh, many parts of China with drier sediments. But we also, uh, but, so it's something to pay attention to in Hokkaido as well. Now, the issue of Japanese millet is also kind of crucial because it is one of the plant remains that's quite common throughout all, most Jomon sites in the northeastern part of Japan, and we find it at 9,000 years ago. It's not the millet, it's the wild ancestor of the millet that shows up fairly early. And then we find more of it as time goes on. And um, by the end of the middle Jomon, we find that the seed sizes have increased in size slightly, but we have found some examples that are phenotypically here. They're, this is the archaeological specimen we found for comparison with the, um, with the uh, reference material, which indicates that there are phenotypic changes taking place, but we don't see uh, here developing full-blown until much, much later in the, um, in the Ainu period, because it involves um, polyploidy and a number of other changes. And I think we're seeing this generally when polyploidy has not really been established. So the way I think about these Jomon sites in terms, I think of agroecology in an extremely broad context in this way. And so my model is very similar to what Nishidu was suggesting in 1983 for the Torihama area, where these communities have different forms of habitats where, where different sorts of plants could be, could be uh, harvested and grown or they would flourish. And I'm just showing you some examples that there may have been gardens and orchards. These edge communities are great for productivity. Got to explore these water edges. The sea less so, unless they were going after kelp or kombu, but so far we don't have the evidence for that. And then there are a variety of other disturbances, tree falls and so forth. And I, I, don't, I don't exclude the possibility that they were burning here, but uh, that would be in a, as a general management tool. So um, to close out, I do want to talk about the Satsumon in the last few minutes. Um, I hope I've got a few minutes left here. And, um, and so the Satsumon culture, these are, these are ancestral Ainu people who also play into this uh, thinking about agroecology. And, and I don't want you to pull out the nuances of this slide, other than I need to point out to you that the Ainu are not remnant Jomon. The, the Ainu are a people with a complex history like most people have. And um, they are mu as much a, a result of everything going on in East Asia and, and um, historic events in, in the rest of China and so forth as they are um, indigenous folks in, uh, in Hokkaido. But I just want to point out to you that their history is really quite complex. I want to draw your attention to the Sakushikotani River site in, in Sapporo. And you can see that we're getting huge quantities of plant remains from this site. And it sits on a beautiful flat Ishikari plain where you can see this green space where the arrow is pointing. And that's the Hokkaido University campus area in the northern sector of, of Sapporo. And in and, and the 1890s, uh, a gentleman mapped all the pit houses that you could still see on the landscape. And he, and he mapped about close to 800 of these pit houses along the landscape. So this area was sustaining a substantial population of period or people over the centuries. And what we found by looking at their plant remains is they were practicing a medieval form of Japanese upland or rain-fed agriculture probably growing this full range of plants, which includes the three types of millets, but many other plants as well. Uh, we have no idea about um, fallow periods and, and the nuances of how this happened, but I just want to point this out. But they also used a wide range of, of local plants that would have been available in the similar habitats to the ones that I pointed out from the Jomon sites, but in also uh, fields, the edges of fields, and so forth. And we also find many of the wild grasses, the weedy grasses that we found in Neolithic China, and many other plants here that we find in the Jomon period, except for crowberry, which is, which is unusual in, um, in the record, but we do find it at these, at these Satsumon sites.
And uh, the, the nature of the assemblage is, is, is quite something. It looks very much like the Chinese Neolithic with the addition of barley and wheat. Uh, the dominant crops tend to be the millets. And this shows that this, this, this system has been sustained for millennia in different circumstances, in different places, and different times in, in Japan. And, um, and finally, just as a wrap up, you can look at this. I'm not going to read this word for word other than to show you that, that these systems began a long time ago and they had periods of stability and sustainability, particularly in China. When, when it began, it didn't launch off into a sustained specialized agriculture. It, it, it reached some kind of a balance and stability for at least four millennia, and, and which is hard to imagine in terms of our modern lives. The Jomon situation is a complex one. And one of the interesting things is people moving into domestication, but using a lot of, um, a lot of different habitats and, and early successional species and, and sort of looking early Neolithic like, it, like the Chinese early Neolithic, but it did not launch into this socioeconomic inequality in urbanism. And then we do have an example of an agroecology in Hokkaido that is probably similar in some ways to medieval um, dry field agriculture, so minus the rice and so forth. And, and to wrap up with my last point, I think that archaeology can, can provide an extraordinarily valuable complementary data set that uh, can, can contribute to this discussion of agroecology. So I'm just going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And uh, um, that was a really good presentation that goes well with Ikea-san. Ikea-san's presentation was focusing more on Kyushu, the southern part of Japan, mm -hmm. and Gary's presentation with a focus on Hokkaido. And in both cases, we really need to think about um, complex history, continuity, and change through time. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yes, while well, waiting for the questions to come in, I missed two questions for Ikea-san. Um, Ikea-san, are you ready to answer the two questions in the Q&A sections? The first one is Kent Lightfoot. Is the slash and burn system always based on cutting branches of trees and then burning the branches? Or do they do the farmers actually burn the vegetation in the landscape? Okay. Now, now I'm, 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 I find out to the Q and A. Sorry. Yes. If you click the bottom Q and A, this is from Kent Lightfoot, who works on um, cultural burning in California. I think uh, the first question. Yes. Uh, is the slash and burn system always based on cutting branch of trees? And yes. The, uh, yes. Uh, this according to the vegetation in the Kyushu mountain also. If uh, grassland uh, vegetation, uh, people not cutting the tree to uh, burning of the, that land. For example, radish uh, be, uh, crops, Radish is very good for grassland, but uh, millet is uh, not so much grassland. Millet is, uh, uh, I don't know the reason, but uh, uh, after the burning, after cutting the trees and burning, uh, millet, is, uh, 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 millet is cultivated. Is it OK, number one? Uh, no. OK, I have to switch to Japanese. Uh, no. えっと、焼き畑する時の木の焼き方なんですけれども、枝を落としてから焼くのか、そのままで火をかけてしまうのかという質問だと思います。え、ことで、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、
Yes, number two um, from Antonio. Latin America. Okay, um, I want to study this across Latin America. Um, where did you start ecology um, or agriculture? Just curious. I think the, we have Barry Sensei, he's specialized yeah. of the Latin American area. <laughs> Maybe uh, I'm not so good person to uh, reply, I think. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then the next question is um, for Gary. Is there an agroecological advantage for allowing the weed grasses to grow in the millet fields? Um, pest or pathogen? Uh, right, I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't thought much about the, the pathogen side of things, but um, Certainly, from the other other perspective, uh, the genetic perspective, mm -hmm. considering that many of these weedy grasses belong to the same genera as the millets, uh, they're they're likely crossing. The ancestors are in the fields, and they're they appear to be crossing with with the with them. So you 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 maintain this diversity, and when when these travel uh, and move around with people, they pick probably pick up the local versions of the, of the, uh, of the weeds and that genetic diversity then, uh, then transfers and continues to develop and allows these millets to become adapted more locally to their, to the new conditions. And they also help keep down, um, erosion. One of the major factors in modern, er modern agriculture is erosion and, uh, and all. And if you allow, if you just let these grasses grow and don't worry about them, um, then, then erosion is cut down and uh, other weed communities are cut down. But even in Ontario today, people are, people are not doing what they did in the past with agriculture. They're, they're, not, um, they're not weeding, they're not using tons of pesticides and they're still getting good maize crops and, having a good t and things are well. So uh, I think this advantage needs more exploration. And I think one of the problems, we, one of the reasons we don't know a lot about this is that the millets are not considered a major world crop. And so you don't have agronomists spending a lot of time on them. They're investing in, in the big dollar crops like rice and soybeans, wheat. Thank you. One more question, and then we'll move on to Biel's comments. So it, this question is from Daniel Niles. Um, at one point in your talk, you made a pretty clear distinction between uh, plant remains and implied land uses of early Holocene and those of previous times. Is there any way to speak about earlier livelihood practices and their landscape um, implications in this region? Hmm, a complicated question, um, Daniel. I'm trying to figure out exactly where to go with this. Um, uh, with earlier livelihood practice and their landscape implications. Um, I, I, I guess I might go to the fact that we have the charred plant remains, but I think you've got to use complementary data such as phytoliths, which have a broader record of the vegetation. I have a graduate student working with starch grains and that's helping out. I think there's sediment analysis. I, I could take your question uh, even further if I do, if I think about it literally when you, when, and maybe I'm, I don't wanna put words into your mouth, but when you think about earlier livelihood practices that triggers a thought about the upper paleolithic in me. And one of the issues that we have to deal with is, uh, is getting upper paleolithic archaeologists to take an interest in these uh, kinds of questions, which which they have done in some areas, and um, and, and particularly in, in Israel and uh, and parts of China. But uh, I'm not sure that I've answered your question adequately. But um, try to give a shot. Thank you, Gary, and we'll continue this conversation. Sure.